Good day, everyone. Doc Mika here, and this is the second video for chapter three. In this video, we will be discussing how we manage open wounds. Right? In the first video, we discussed the methods of wound healing, namely primary intention, secondary intention, and tertiary intention. But how do we manage or how do we employ secondary intention, right? Or even tertiary intention? What if the wound edges of the wound that we are trying to close or we want to close are too far from each other, right? And however much you try to st stretch that skin, right? There is too much tension and your wound or your sutures will just dehiss, right? And your primary surgical repair or repair plan is failed before you even know it, right? So how do we manage these? All right. So our objective is from an initial open contaminated wound like this one, right? Doesn't matter about how it happened, right? More so if it's um, just uh, what matters if it is open, it is contaminated to begin with. Um, we want it to be surgically clean, right? We want those wounds to be cleaned and debrided before any healing could occur because any foreign body that is in there, any microorganisms that have contaminated the wound will retard or will um, have a negative effect on the healing phases that we have discussed, all right? If your inflammatory cells are overwhelmed with gross and microscopic debris on the wound, it will not be able to do so much uh, as per the healing process when it is overwhelmed by killing um, and phagocytosing a lot of debris, which we could remove manually by ourselves, right? So these are nine fundamental steps in management of open wounds. Of course, um, this is not a one list solution we're in every patient that you will um, that you will face in your veterinary career will undergo everything. Of course, some of these are indicated for some, for some uh, for others they would need they would sometimes need more, all right? So it is up to you as a veterinarian how to assess and evaluate uh, your patients and the wound that you want to manage, all right? And one thing about open wound management is you have to, um, you have to align the expectations of the client to the process that you are expecting to undergo and um, the capacity of the patient to undergo such management, right? Because this is an open wound, it will take longer and uh, depending on the extent of the injury, depending on the depth of the injury, all right? So you have to manage their expectations. I always say, um, expect the worst, hope for the best. And that also applies for any other, um, any case that I face. All right, so let's discuss each fundamental um, uh, rule or a fundamental step one by one. All right, number one is wound cover or protection. Your patient, all right, and this also applies to your pets, whatever happens, or with you. Um, before you do anything, that wound, an open wound, needs to be covered and thus protected from any other uh, uh, what do you call this, um, further contamination by the environment, right? Just by air, by uh, further debris, dirt, right? From you, because we are also a colossal walking microorganism uh, pool, right? And there is a golden period for this, right? Um, within six to eight hours after injury, Right? This is the period we're in. Bacterial contamination leads to infection, wherein there is a constant multiplication and level of microorganisms in an area. Right? And if you want to manage or you want to initiate your fundamental steps within or before you reach the golden period. All right? And 
This would ensure that your wound or the wound that you want to manage would be prevented from further trauma or contamination. Remember, your patient is in pain. You, it, may, uh, it may not show or it may not be growling. It may not be crying. But just imagine yourself with a wound of a certain size. Of course, you would be in pain. So that is also something that you have to consider that the patients would try to lick that wound, would try to kick on that wound, would try to do something for it. And if you don't cover it, you might be doing something even worse um, to begin with uh, as compared to the initial injury itself. All right? And what can we use as a temporary cover for superficial wounds? Right. You can use your sterile gauze sponges, right? These are individually packed. If you have in your clinic uh, autoclaved sponges, that will work as well. Uh, sterile laparotomy sponges would be a bigger sponge. If you, I don't know if your <laughs> a batch or your age would have the lampin, if you're familiar with that, those are of the same uh, quality or material and thickness as laparotomy sponges. And some adhesive wound dressings, which are commercially available, can be used as well as temporary covers, right? If the wound is actively bleeding, if uh, the trauma or whatever caused the insult on this patient caused active uh, bleeding, meaning an artery is um, continually um, losing blood, right? Uh, you could use an occlusive gauze sponge, meaning you have the normal gauze sponge, but then you wrap it tightly on that area, either by an elastic bandage or a vet wrap, right? Basically, you're putting pressure on that area. If you don't have those, then you have to do it by hand, right? If your patient is not kicking, your patient is not biting, right? That's also one thing you have to consider when you want to initiate management, right? You have to consider your patient. Is it in pain? Is it crying? Is it aggressive? Then you have to um, institute the right sedation, um, all this um, anxiolytic drug for you to be able to manage the wound, all right? Number two, again, this, oh, I'm leading to that actually. Patient assessment and stabilization. Before you can start any treatment, the animal must be assessed for any existing problem uh, call this um, behaviorally, physically, um, uh, blood test wise, right? Which may affect your entire treatment plan for that wound. So you have to assess the physical and mental status. Is your patient aggressive? Is your patient depressed? Is it still responsive or is it an comatose, right? So when you manage open wounds, you're not just managing the wound itself. You have to consider the whole patient as it is. Right. Fluid therapy, it is very common that patients with open wounds, burn wounds, even um, the actively bleeding wounds are losing fluid by every minute. So you have to find a way to replace uh, that fluid loss. Right? Pain management is very important. Wherever the wound is, your patient needs analgesic. So you have to find a way as well to uh, manage that pain for you to be able to institute your treatment protocol. And if there is a need for sedation, then go for it, right? Clipping and aseptic preparation, right? Here is a very common contaminant, very common debris on open wounds, all right? Um, so for you to assess the wound itself, right? You have to clip the hair around the wound, all right? You have to make a wide clipping uh, protocol for, your, uh, for the wound, okay? And when you encounter uh, dog bites, okay, dog bite wounds, especially if your patient is a hairy dog, you might not be able to see the wound itself, right? Especially if it's not bleeding and the hair is occluding your vision of the entire thing. I have had patients where and they needed to be shaved that for the entire body, like for example, a very long haired, uh, for example, a Yorkshire Terrier or a Pomeranian, all right? And they was, uh, sorry, they were bitten by a big dog, by a stray dog, right? Very common uh, complaint uh, when I was working as a tech. 
all right? So we had to shave the entire body of the dog to be able to identify all wounds that are present in the patient's body, all right? Because we'll discuss this in a bit and also in more detail in surgery too for, uh, the, for chapter one, actually. Um, why is it important for you to identify all the wounds, right? But when we are talking about open wounds, um, classically, they would usually be very evident, right? So what you have to do is first protect the wound with a sterile water-soluble lubricant. So usually the KY jelly, this is usually the lubricant that you use for the rectal thermometers before you use it on a patient. Or you could, uh, if you don't have it, then you could use a sponge, which is soaked with saline, right? You have to protect that wound before you clip so that you will prevent any further uh, contaminant or foreign body to enter the wound while you're hair clipping. And remember hair, pag nagpagupit ka, masakit siya, di ba? Yung mga maliliit na nakiklip na hair. And that will also imagine that, um, that piece of small, sharp hair hitting uh, meat, you know, hitting soft tissue, okay? With no skin barrier. That will be very painful. It's already irritating for us. Uh, when we, you know, when we have our hair cut, but imagine you have an open wound and then you're going to add hair, all right? So very important. And then you have to aseptically prepare, okay, that area that you shaved, right? You can use skin scrubs like a povidone iodine or betadine or chlorhexidine gluconate solutions. Um, chlorhexidine gluconate solutions are not as uh, often used, I believe, in the Philippines. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I haven't been in a clinic in the Philippines for a while, but um, because it's more expensive than povidone, right? That's basically the main issue. If you go to Bang Bang, you know, when you go back to school, uh, and then you have to buy all these surgical things, um, you you will see how the prices are. Betadine, you know, you can buy a gallon of it easy, but if you look for chlorhexidine, it's quite uh, it's color pink right? It's quite expensive, but it is expensive for a reason because it is the, the thing that is used worldwide already, all right? Um, of course, in the open wound, you do not use alcohol on the exposed tissue, okay? And it must only be used in the intact skin around that wound, right? Number one, you might think, masakit. Yeah, sure, yeah, masakit. But also, alcohol is a dehydrating agent. You do not want your tissues to be void of any hydration when it is needed for the healing process. This is also why nutrition comes into play for wound healing or any delay that you might expect, <clears throat> right? So do not use alcohol. You're basically just damaging the wound that you want to repair. Next. All right. Oh, this is just a, a video. This is the left hind limb, I believe. It has a laceration, but I will, I'm not able to play it. I will just attach it with the post and I will uh, give you a lot of links for uh, open wound management. There are basically clinical cases that some vets posted uh, in YouTube and you can see how they do it. Of course, they will not be the same with each other and even with mine or with this lesson, but you can see the variation and you can see the typical flow Okay, of how you manage open wounds and usually the timetable or timeline that you are expecting, right? So fourth is the wound culture, right? All non-surgical wounds that you encounter, meaning you're not the one doing it, are presumed contaminated when patients are brought in, right? And this is, only, this is not just for open, um, for big lacerations. This is also applicable for puncture wounds, for uh, even abrasions, all right? So just for open wounds. So the wounds within the um, presented within the golden period with minimal trauma and contamination, these are usually cleaned and closed only, and there's no need for antibiotics. However, you will meet a lot of veterinarians who are very reliant on antibiotics. That's them, all right? But this is uh, basically what the books say. So that's what I'm teaching you. When you get your license, when you and you uh, graduate and graduate and get your license, you are now free to develop your style based on your experience and knowledge. All right, you're free to go. Now, when it is indicated, antibiotic therapy um, can be given. 
all right? If the wounds have been there and non-managed for, for more than six to eight hours, um, they are visibly uh, and evidently severely contaminated. It's crushed, infected, evidence of pus or abscesses uh, and necrosis. And please do not forget the importance of bacterial culture and antibiotic sensitivity before you give antibiotics, right? Uh, with the, uh, you know, the, the era of antibiotic uh, microbial resistance, um, and we are every day finding it hard to, to find um, antibiotics which will work in, in septic patients, in severely uh, septic patients. It's very hard. So we have to always employ uh, all this mm, vigilant use of antibiotics, even for us. And um, the usual go-to, the usual go-to being a broad spectrum antibiotic, being a very available cheaply and uh, cheap antibiotic is cefazolin, usually given at a dose of 22 mg per keg IV. And this may be given while waiting for culture results. Cultures are important. For me, it is necessary. I would culture every patient I would meet. Um, it's just the limiting factor would be the client saying no because it's uh, quite expensive. However, you do not have to wait for the results of the culture before you initiate antibiotic therapy. When your patient is visibly infected, when your patient is visibly showing signs of infection, start your antibiotic therapy, do your culture, sorry, do your culture, start your antibiotic therapy with a, a very good broad spectrum antibiotic, and then you wait for the results, okay? And then initiate changes if needed. If you found out with your culture that it is resistant to cephalosporins, then you have to find the antibiotic which the bacteria causing the infection is still susceptible to, right? So it's just a balance of your time. You know, if of course the first one would be shotgun, right? But do you do your work very well and very thorough para alam mo na kahit shotgun yung una, it is working. And if you don't, if and if you were if you discover that it was not working, apparently the patient is resistant, now you use that knowledge. You use that to pinpoint a more targeted therapeutic approach. Right? Hindi naman mahirap yun explain sa kliente. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's okay. Right? Wound lavage. Right? Your patient, uh, the, the, the skin is clipped, the hair is clipped, you aseptically prepared it. Right? You did your culture. Now you want to clean that wound, right? You want to start cleaning that wound. And the basic, I think, uh, this was not taught to me when I was in college, but I, I was in college surgery one, uh, let me think, nine years ago. Nine, eight, eight, I'm not sure. What's that? Gonna nakatagal, so maybe it changed. But back then, I wasn't, we, we weren't taught this, you know? Uh, we were taught to suture, suture everything. So um, wound lavage is something that I saw and practiced myself when I worked abroad. And this is the mechanical reduction of uh, bacterial numbers and gross contaminants. Could be dirt, could be wood, could be soil on the wound by loosening and flushing it away um, with uh, manually. Okay, with the following or with the choices of the following substances, all right? Basically, when you want to clean your car, you don't start with soap, all right? You don't start with soap immediately. You start with a pressurized water hose, correct? Tell me you have seen how car wash works, <laughs> all right? And um, basically, that's how we do it, okay? We want, um, even if you think you do not see anything that is contaminating, okay? You don't see any gross contaminants anymore. You, uh, you think you're good, okay? The only way that you will efficiently remove those contaminants, right? Uh, manually removing them from the patient would be through wound lavage, right? You could use a sterile saline, sterile LRS. I, I, what do you call it? Um, these are isotonic crystalloids, which will not do anything to your, to your wound. Tap water is something that I learned and is really good, all right, um, for big, uh, for larger animals, right? 
And also you would have commercially available wound cleansers for this reason. Um, and also the all around betadine and chlorhexidine. Let's, let's uh, discuss this one by one, all right? Oh, sorry, I'll discuss the lavage first, all right? This, uh, how we do it is um, called a high pressure lavage, right? Imagine if you have a, you know, the hose, you know how the pressure and velocity works, right? If you, if you decrease the circumference of the, of the tube, your pressure goes up. If you increase the circumference, your pressure goes down. Basically this thing, you want to um, call this, uh, take advantage of that, right? And the usual materials that we use would be, you have your fluid bag, right? As you can see in the picture, it is connected to an IV line. And your IV line is connected to a three-way stopcock, right? Your three-way stopcock is this one. Basically, it's a port, okay? Imagine a port, and then it has uh, three um, attachments, okay? It can be attached to three things. So what you could do is have a syringe here, a high-volume syringe. You could go for 25 mil, 60 mil, depending on the size of the animal and the size of the wound. On the other one is a needle. It's usually a 21 gauge or 18 gauge. And then you, it is connected to the IV line. The stopcock is, damn it, how do I explain this? It's very easy when I have the stopcock in my hand and then you see it happening. Uh, <laughs> you can also Google it. But basically, this will enable you to aspirate fluid here easily, right? Uh, really fast as compared to you connecting the, the syringe and the needle to the fluid bag, aspirate, and then, you know, detach it and then, uh, you know, attach the needle. It, it's a long process, but you want your wound lavage to be continuous, right? So this enables that, right? All right. Uh, two seconds. Hold on. Um, you, this blue thing, all right, this blue thing, you see this one, mayroon siya parang arrow on that area, this one, when this one points to that port, okay, that um, direction is open, kumbaga, bukas yung pinto, basically, ang three-way stopcock ay may tatlong pinto, right, kapag nakaturo dun sa isang lugar yung pinto, <laughs> right, that open, okay? Meaning, your fluid can flow from the fluid bag, okay, through here, all right? And when you, uh, what do you call this? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Damn it, let's cut that out. When it is pointing in that direction, it's actually closed. Ah, oh, man, all right? When this blue thing, okay, the arrow that you see is pointing in that direction, Okay, that door is closed. The stopcock has three doors. This one, this one, and this one. Okay, that's why it's a three-way stopcock. <laughs> right? When this blue knob is pointing in this direction, okay, fluid from here cannot flow through here. So the only way you the only way the stopcock is open is from the syringe to the needle, right? And that enables the fluid in your syringe to go through the needle. Now, kapag na ubus na yan, okay, you're gonna need you're going to need more fluid. So what you do is turn the knob to the left, to the needle, to stop the fluid or stop the, basically to close the door, okay? And this opens the door for the fluid from here to go to your syringe. And then you close it again. Basically, that's the, that's the flow, all right? And sometimes you also have lavage machines. Tipong uh, nakakabit na yung fluid sa isang uh, machine and then it has the, the needle on it. And uh, another thing is that you could go, you know, you could, let me call this, you can skip the use of a stopcock itself, connect the needle to the IV line, and then um, do your lavage. However, it's not as high pressure as this mechanism. So what you do is that as you use this needle, okay, you use this, uh, yeah, needle. <laughs> All right, to clean the wound, right? The fluid from there to clean the wound. Someone is a pinipigatong fluid to create pressure, right? To, to increase the pressure, all right? Because basically you're just going free flow. Walang mangyayari sa wound pag hindi high pressure. It will not be able to remove any contaminants if it's just dripping water, right? 
And do, how do we use tap water? Uh, high pressure, lalagay ba sa fluid bag? No. You connect your um, bidet. You, you, know the, you know the idea of the bidet? Basically like that. But however, you're not going to bring a patient into the restroom and do the, use the bidet, right? What, I, well, what we did or what I also saw was, remember in the clinic, you have the, the faucet there, usually it's a table. We call this. You have the exam table and usually exam tables have the sink under it. You have the water faucet there. What we did was connect that one to a shower head. No, diba mahaba yan? Shower head. We just we just connected the tube to a shower head additive. Para pag meron kami ilalabaj with tap water, we just grab the shower head, turn it on, and then it's high pressure, right? So basically, you you have to find a way. <laughs> you have to find a way because this mechanism um, takes a while. Number one. Um, you have to attach everything. Number two, it costs too much. You're going to use sterile. Uh, you're going to use a sterile um, one liter LRS on a horse. Hmm. But, so you have to find a way. All right. Okay. Now, uh, sterile saline and sterile LRS are uh, balanced electrolyte solutions. Preferably when you use them as uh, wound lavage fluids, these are warmed. All right. Um, these are usually placed in an incubator. Uh, ideally, <laughs> you place sterile fluids in an incubator. So whenever you need warm fluids, you have it. Um, this is the preferred lavage solution, of course, because they are, they are isotonic. Um, it causes no cellular changes um, on the wound. And the thing is, um, if you used a fluid which is too warm, all right, it may cause significant cellular tissue damage because you're burning the patient. If cold solutions, naman, this will cause the vessels to constrict. And remember, the first phase of wound healing is inflammatory. All right? You do not want your vessels to constrict because the needed inflammatory cells and red blood cells and platelets that are needed on that injury will not be able to um, travel right? if your vessels are constricted. Right? Tap water, inexpensive, readily available, easy to use. However, it was found to uh, cause hypotonic tissue damage if you do it too long, all right? This was, uh, that, that um, point was pointed, to, pointed out to me <laughs> by my professor, that uh, professor slash boss, um, that this only happens if you use it too long, okay? So when you use tap water, you do it fast, you clean the wound, and then that's it, right? Wound cleansers are commercially available manufactured substances used for uh, as wound cleansers, all right? These are non-cytotoxic. They also act as a surfactant, breaking the bond between the foreign body and the wound surface, which when you encounter it, they tend to stick, all right? It is convenient because you, you just grab it from the, you know, you just grab it from a shelf and use it, but they are expensive. And some wound cleansers, uh, were found to delay wound healing, right? But sometimes, as pointed out to me as well, there are, there are cases wherein you do not want your healing to occur so fast. You do not want your wound to contract so fast, right? We'll discuss this in a bit, right? So these are examples of those cleansers, Dermagran, Veteracin, Biovetrex, again, quite expensive, right? Now, Pavidone iodine and chlorhexidine are very, very uh, commonly used. Okay? They also have an antimicrobial effect, um, but they need to be diluted if you're going to use them as wound lavage of, um, of these formula, basically. Right? And if you exceed 1% of your reconstitution of these substances, it becomes cytotoxic. And also, as we discussed in the... Um, was that the surgical asepsis? Uh, yeah, surgical asepsis lecture, right? Um, some of it can be inactivated by organic matter, uh, can cause contact hypersensitivity, though rare, and thyroid disorders for povidone iodine if absorbed, right? So the debridement, okay, you have cleaned the wound. There are no gross contaminants, ready to go, right? Now, how do we debride and why do we need to debride? Right, the uh, debridement right is the removal of devitalized, damaged, and or necrotic tissue. 
the the flow between the vitalized damage to necrotic to necrosis is quite fast right so basically i always say necrotic tissue that's it right foreign bodies and microorganisms which can compromise local immune mechanisms and delay healing all right your uh the phases of healing cannot um occur right properly in a proper way if you do not debride right if there is necrotic tissue if there is any foreign body left in your wound bed any microorganisms that will not just delay healing but can cause more problems for you down the road right and there are a lot of ways to do this but first how do we identify necrotic tissue hmm? you know you that all right how do we how do we know the tissue is necrotic or it's healthy Color number one. What color would it be? What happens when a, a, a tissue undergoes necrosis? It dies. Why does it die? What does it need? Oxygen. So it it, it lacks oxygen. So it's usually pale. Number one. Or when it goes to the advanced levels of necrosis, you would go to gray, black. Right. That's a those are devitalized or necrotic tissue. What else? Sometimes they would have a smell. They would also have um, a certain friability to them. Mas madali siyang tanggalin as compared to normal living tissue. Number three, uh, number three, number four. It, it bleeds. When you cut into it, it bleeds. Okay? If you're cutting, for example, you're cutting this tissue and there's no bleeding, it's just correct that you're cutting that tissue because your tissue will become a foreign body that you are trusting your immune system to kill and to dissolve, right? Um, if you don't remove it. So you have to remove it to help the immune system itself to focus on the more, uh, you know, the, the other significant um, steps during the wound healing, right? So you need to debride. You need to be very, and you need to be very uh, vigilant with this. Okay? Dito minsan, nagkaharoon ng problema sa kliyente kasi ang unang nakita nilang wound, maliit lang. But you saw that the damage, uh, there is a lot of damage underneath the skin. So you had to remove it. For, and for you to remove it, you need to make a bigger incision. So you have to discuss this. This needs to be very clear to the, to the client. Right? So, what are the ways that we could uh, remove these uh, necrotic tissues? Number one is surgical. Basically, grab your instruments, remove it, right? And when you do this, it's very selective because you get to choose what you remove and what you leave behind. So you have to make sure that you are only leaving behind healthy tissue to promote healing and not to retard it in any way. And you can do this in two ways, bilayer or end block, right? Bilayer right, is every layer of the skin and subcutaneous tissue that you see or is part of the wound is, ex uh, is examined for damaged tissue, all right? You have to see it. So basically, the bigger the wound is, the bigger work it is, all right? But if you do your debridement right, every process of the healing will go right as well. If you do this wrong, everything will go to shit, all right? So, what do we usually preserve? Of course, we preserve intact bones, right? Tendons, nerves, blood vessels, if you can preserve them, especially superficial blood vessels, quite hard, right? Muscles, they need to be, uh, they need to bleed and contract when they are tried to cut, meaning it has a normal blood supply and nerve supply, both sensory and motor, right? Fat. Fat is very easily devitalized because they also have low vascularity towards them. They don't need it as much. So, usually, ang fat ang una mong nakikita ng um, very friable. Siya yung nagpapakuha agad. <laughs> Basically, that's my term. Nagpapakuha siya agad. You know, you just lift it, it tears, right? So, you, a fat in a wound is extensively removed, right? Now, with end block, with end block, if you think, right, if you think there's a lot of the, the wound edges, for example, example, the wound edges surrounding the wound is 
necrotic or showing signs of necrosis, you decide to remove the entire wound edge so that you will be starting with a normal, healthy, bleeding wound edge. All right? You want those wound edges to be bleeding so that you know it has intact vascular supply. All right? So you have to, again, educate your clients when you're expecting to do this. All right? Because they would be expecting this small wound and now they're faced with a big one. Mm. You have to um, talk to them why it is needed, right? Number two is autolytic debridement, right? Basically, you're using, um, you're taking advantage of certain bandages, right? Which keeps certain enzymes in that wound, which will do the debridement for, debridement for you, right? So why? The, that wound will uh, secrete, right? Endogenous enzymes, certain enzymes which will dissolve non-viable tissue. Yes, it will, but it might take some time. So this is only um, this is only uh, applicable for those which you are suspecting necrosis will happen, or there's not much devitalized tissue that you don't need to operate on it. All right. So you will use hydrophilic occlusive or semi-occlusive bandages to create a moist wound environment. Right? So those enzymes will be there. The wounds are covered for 72 to 96 hours under occlusive bandage. This may um, affect, uh, sorry, this may be influenced by what bandage you use. Right? Usually it's in the, the packaging of it. And these enzymes are good because it is highly selective to devitalize tissue. It will only select those tissues which needs to be removed that they will remove. All right? So um, with a moist wound as well, the advantages of it is it's less painful for the patient, it's less sporadic, and it has less scar formation, right? So these are examples of those occlusive bandages. You have so, uh, sodium alginate, which, is, which has also shown um, benefits of wound healing on itself, gelonet, right, and seroform, right? And these are manufactured this way and a sort of, of various sizes of various thickness for that reason. It is for autolytic debridement, right? Mechanical debridement though, right? Is also what we call bandage debridement, okay? You're gonna use your normal bandages, gauze sponges wrapped with cotton padding, uh, wrapped with wet wrap, right? Wet to dry, dry to dry bandages that you allow to dry on the wound, right? Usually, these bandages are manufactured wet or you soak gauze sponges in saline, right? Put it on top of the wound, right? Let it adhere on the wound surface. And then the next day, it's actually dried out. Just basically, yes, water evaporate. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? When you remove that bandage and that bandage is ay nakadikit dun sa sugat, right? And you pull the bandage. This will also pull the debris out and strip the superficial layers of the wound bed when removed. And if you imagine it that way, yes, it is very painful and it is non-selective. Meaning if your patient is starting granulation, if your uh, patient has scabs, this will also remove the scabs, right? It is very painful and non-selective, yet it is cheap, right? So um, dressings, would provide adequate wound coverage and protection. They would also maintain moisture and absorb the exudates produced or secreted on the wound, right? And again, the wet to dry bandage that we usually go for is a sterile uh, gauze sponge uh, soaked in saline. The advantage of this is that yung wet dressing, yung saline don, will dilute the wound exudate, which the second layer above the dressing, which is the cotton padding, will absorb. So it tends to absorb faster than dry dressings, and it is more comfortable because it's moist. However, again, pain, okay? Bacterial proliferation, because you're keeping it there. Tissue maceration, because it's non-selective, right? And strike through. What do we mean by strike through? This is when, oh, sorry. This is an example of that, right? This is a cat with an esophagostomy tube. I can see that from here, okay? With this wound, right? They try to 
close the wound or make it smaller by using primary incension on these areas. But they are still left with a, quite a significant size of open wound there. So they used, um, they want to um, bandage that and make use of mechanical debridement, right? So you have a gauze sponge wet with saline, cover it with another um, gauze sponge, which is dry, right? Then wrap it around the patient, okay? Secure it around the patient, right? So that is uh, an example of how it's done, right? Strike through, going back. Strike through is when you see exudent, okay? Exudent or signs of ex uh, exudation through the outermost bandage layer. When we bandage patients, usually see, see malinis. Wala kang may kitang dugo, wala kang may kitang nana, malinis, okay? You want to protect that wound. You want to keep the bandage there for debridement for purposes. Or if you put any wound medication on that wound, creams, ointments, uh, antibiotics, you want to keep it there, right? And if there is strike through, meaning the exudates, exudates has pushed through your layers of bandaging, right? That is a sign that you need to change that bandage, right? Because your bandage is no use anymore. Your bandage is supposed to soak all those wound exudates. And if it has, if you see it already from the outside, then it has soaked through, right? Uh, this is an example of a, oh, I forgot the brand of this one, sorry. Um, but basically, this is an image of a strike through, all right? Um, you have this one as the coverage for that one, sorry, for, that, for this wound, all right? So they have indications for what it means, all right? But basically, when you see it, even a sign of it, even just a part, even a speck of it, um, or maybe I'm just being too uh, OC about it. But, but when I see a part, um, a speck of it or, or like a dot, I have to see what's going on inside, right? Is there too much exudation happening? Is my bandage too thin? Is my bandage too tight, right? So you have to, to, to look into that. Um, enzymatic debridement. Um, in autolytic, you're using the enzymes produced by the patient itself. With enzymatic debridement, you are using commercially available substances, right? Which you place on wounds, which break down necrotic tissue. It will also liquefy the crust, the scabs, coagulated blood, and bacterial biofilms, which will, at, at a certain point, will help you as you transition from inflammatory phase to um, debridement phase, right? Um, this, is all, this is an adjunct to wound lavage and surgical debridement, meaning you do not just use this um, these um, substances, and then you skip lavage and debridement, all right? This is just use an, an additive, all right? This also allows better antibiotic contact with wounds, which is good. Uh, enhanced exposure for immune system development. Um, needs adequate time to work. That's one thing. Um, this is uh, some of those things that it is um, sprayed on the, on the patient. And sa tinasabihin ng kliente na, ma'am, make sure na hindi niya didilaan. Make sure na hindi niya, yeah, make sure na hindi niya ididikit sa kung saan lugar. All right? Uh, some uh, side effects, uh, local tissue irritation, which is quite common. Biosurgical debridement. This is where animation is so good, but then I didn't have animation for this one. This is what we call MAGA therapy. All right? This is indicated for necrotic, infected, and chronic non-healing wounds, bed sores, um, those with uh, secondary conditions which affect wound healing hypoadrenal cortis system, diabetes mellitus, and also this is used um, by humans as well, actually. And what is good with this one is that these uh, uh, green bottle fly, uh, larvae, the cilia, secrete proteolytic enzymes into the wound, right? They secrete these enzymes, which, um, uh, what do you call this? Liquefies or debrides or eats, um, uh, breaks down <laughs> these uh, necrotic tissue. However, they require an opti optimal temperature. Again, this would depend on the country. That's why it, it's empty there. It would depend on the country. Uh, oxygen supply and moist food, right? One larva can consume up to 75 mg of necrotic tissue per day. Imagine how much, diba? And um, five to eight larvae per square centimeter of wound is usually the dose for it. And is usually done twice in 48 hour cycles per week. Right, basically every two to three days. Right, have I seen this done? Have I seen it? Yeah, did I go close to it? No, 
because I'm a, I don't like worms so much. So <laughs> kind of icky, but it works. It actually works. It's just hard to maintain the larvae to stay in a certain body part. Na, for example, if the patient's wound is on the thorax, it's quite easy. You let the patient lie on its, you know, on the other side, the uninjured side, and you let the larva, you know, crawl all, all over the other side, diba? It will stay there. But if it's the limb, sometimes it's like the lower limb, right? They tend to fall. <laughs> you know, they tend to fall. So you have to find a way to orient the patient, all right, when this is being done. Right, because what we what I saw before was it was on the limb. It was an avulsion. It was like a, the gloving part of the limb, and it's been a while. The the, the dog was left um, in the. The owners didn't care. Basically, they think it, it's a it's a you know it's a mountain dog. It will it will heal you know on its own. It's fine. But then it got rescued, so we found it. So we tried. Uh, Uh, the doctors tried a lot of things already, you know, went to surgery multiple times, but then it didn't. So they tried it. And yeah, it took a while. It took a while. <laughs> but it worked, which is cool. So that's why I inserted it here. Okay, wound drainage. Okay, you have the, bre uh, the breaded. Now, why is wound drainage important? Remember, wounds secrete exudates. You have tears, discharges. If it's infected, you would have the mucopurulent discharges, right? And when your wound happens, right, the normal anatomy of the skin of the patient or even the, the, the limb or the muscle, a part of it is taken out. And you cannot, what do you call it? Your goal is to restore the space, okay? However, however, during the wound healing, It does not happen that way. You know, uh, your connective tissue would not just fill in the gap that was um, taken out by the traumatic event that caused the wound, right? This dead space is also caused by, um, what do you call this, the continuing damage or pathology inside of any infection or of any inflammation. And while the wound is healing, right, there is accumulation of the blood and serum in that area, Right, in that area, which the body is also trying to cover with the with a cloth with a scab, right? And this becomes a good good environment for bacterial proliferation. So you want to remove that dead space. You want to compress it. You don't want any dead space inside. How do we do that? Right. Number one, layered wound closure. This is why we close wounds in layers. For example, we did a spay. Okay, you mana kita na pa mag spay. Right, your suture or your your wound closure starts with the peritoneum, then you do the muscles, or then you do the fat if there is fat, and then you do the skin, so that there is no dead space in the middle. Okay, now suture obliteration is also one thing. Uh, compression bandages and drain placement. Discuss this one by one. Okay. Oh shit, I didn't. <laughs> All right. Um, suture obliteration. Damn it. So easy when there's a laboratory. Um, basically, basically, let's try to uh, hold on. Whiteboard. I'll try. Uh, I'll try. <laughs> let's try our best. All right. Um, mm -hmm. You have a patient. Oh, why is it blue? <laughs> All right. Tail, leg. You want to make a, uh, sorry, you made an incision here, right? The abdomen, umbilicus is here, right? Did a spay. Imagine this one if we cut it transverse, all right? Uh, sorry, first time doing it, I'm so sorry. All right, let's make it black. All right. Skin. Uh, oh, wait. Forgive me. <laughs> We can do this. All right. Yeah, the skin here. Okay. The, that was cut. You have an incision there. Okay. Then you have the fat. Let's try it. Let's make it yellow. You have the fat underneath. It was also cut. Okay. 
Then you have uh, the muscle. If this is a cat, let's say it's uh, in the peritoneum itself. All right. This is the muscle. Right. Straighted. Shut up. <laughs> Try my best here, guys. All right. Um, when you do your space, when you do your space, um, and uh, the mm, the indus uh, sorry the indus uh, no back <laughs> oh there you go the indus the intestines are right here la 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 transverse cut egg on the back transverse cut <laughs> the intestines are right there right transverse I'm convincing myself this is a good image but it's not all right when you do your incision okay when you do your incision you you cut it there yep all right. Got it here. Okay. So you made an insertion, right? Up to the peritoneum. Let's imagine the, that um, this is still uh, intact. Okay? The peritoneum is still intact. Right? You don't have that much space here. Okay? You do not... Uh, sorry. Uh, I don't know if you could see the arrow though. You do not have enough space in <laughs> the fat area. Okay? It's just fatty. Okay? Mahirap makita yung layer na to. All right? So for you to be able to see that, the peritoneum, for you to see the, what do we call this? The, the Linnea Alba. Okay, let's see. It's the Linnea Alba. Oh, so cool. Right? For you to see the Linnea Alba, you need to make space. So a common thing that we do, okay, as uh, surgeons is that we remove a lot of fat. Not everything, sorry. <laughs> okay? Not everything. We usually remove the fat near the incision. Okay? So there's still no fat there. We remove the fat here and here. Right? So... So we cut, uh, sorry, we we cut the, sorry, we cut the, we cut it under the Nea Alba. So now you have that much space, right? Now, that space, if you're just gonna suture, if you're just gonna suture this one, you leave a big space here and here, right? Even if you, even if you suture, uh, let me figure this out. Even if you suture this one, right? If you su suture that one, great, right? You suture it. Good. No space there. However, with your fat, remember your fat is friable. Our fat, the fat is friable. Okay. If you try to, to um, call this to, sorry. If you try to suture this one to this one, okay? This fat will just break. Right, and that will leave you with a big space there. All right, so what we do, sorry, let me restore the <laughs> sorry, guys. This is uh, oh, shit. damn, I hate it. All right, fat, 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 you have a space, All right? So, what we try to do is to obliterate the dead space by suturing on that area, by compressing the skin downward, all right? How do we do that? How do we do that with a suture? It's the magic of sutures. You can, since you're controlling the sutures, you, 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 what do you call this? You control where they go. So what you do, or what we do, is you put your suture here first, through the skin, okay? Alabas, okay? Hook this part here, anchor it on the muscle, okay? Anchor it on the muscle, go out, okay? Go to the other part, go to the other uh, direction of the other wound edge. Go to the wound edge, all right? Anchor the fat here. Usually in normal sutures, okay? In normal sutures, you go up like that, but no, not, not this time. What you're gonna do is from the farther part of the wound edge, you're gonna bring it in, all right? 
this will pull, okay? This will pull the fat, the space here, that way, all right? That's going to look good. All right, so now if when when you look at it, okay, let's erase all of that. Let's erase it. It doesn't look like a good arrow. All right. When you look at it, na pag na suture mo na, magkakadikit na yan. Right. This will be pushed up. This fat will be pushed to lower side. So this space, hmm. This space here will be compressed. Ba? Kasi mag compress silang lahat eh. Again, it's so easy to just show it to you in the clinic. <laughs> but let's hope. Let's hope that, you know, I get to go back to school anyway. All right. Uh, okay. <laughs> this is what we call walking the suture. Okay. Instead of a firm. Uh, direction of your needle, you're anchoring your needle towards the spaces where it needs to be compressed. All right? Okay, going back. <laughs> All right. Um, compression bandages is basically the same thing, but you're compressing it with bandages. You're, you're wrapping the bandage tightly. And drain placement. Drain placement is a mainstay method of removing dead space, right? You're putting uh, basically... Uh, <laughs> a tube inside for the dead space. So, uh, oh, through the dead space para hindi mag-accumulate yung fluid sa loob ng dead space and that it will be able to escape. So, you're putting an escape route for the wound exudates from the inside. right? And this is uh, commonly indicated for bite wounds, lacerations, skin avulsions, mastectomy, seromas, abscesses, wherein you are expecting uh, the, the loss of significant soft tissue inside that wound or on that wound itself, right? So um, this will allow the evacuation of potentially harmful fluids, pus, serum, blood from the wound bed. Uh, you eliminate dead space, okay? And you maintain contact of if you are using a skin graft or a flap to the wound surface, right? You want your uh, wound to be directly on top or directly covered by, um, they call this, your skin graft, or if you're suturing the, the wound edges, you don't want any space under it. Because if there's any space, expect that that wound will swell. It will get swollen. And when you touch it, it's very tender because it's just full of fluid that needs to get out, right? So how do we do this? You have the passive drains, active drains. The main difference is passive drains, you're relying on gravity. Active drains, you're relying on an active vacuum that is removing that, uh, the fluids, right? So um, again, passive drains, cheap active drains, kind of takes more expertise and technical knowledge and they're expensive, all right? So let's, uh, let's um, call this start with passive drains. The most common uh, passive drain is the Penrose drain. That's the, the yellowish straw-like structure you see there, right? Uh, how do I explain how it looks like? It's like a flat hose, okay? Imagine the, the fettuccine with a hole inside. It's that flat, right? So one end of the drain, <laughs> it's very hard to be creative, guys. One end of the drain is placed and secured inside the wound, okay? So you make a puncture wound here. I don't know. Oh, sorry. I don't know if you could see the mouse Ooh. here, right? You, you push through the drain there, right? And then the drain will end um, inside the wound, right? The other end must exit around one centimeter at least from the primary incision and position for optimal drainage, which... When you think about it, if it relies on gravity, then you have to place it in a way that gravity will work, right? Drains are, uh, you do not place drains in a, for example, a horizontal fashion because where would the fluid go? So you have to place it in a way that gravity will work, right? And then the wound is then covered with sterile compressive bandage. If you're planning on closing this wound with primary intention, go ahead. Um, but then you still have to do compressive bandage for it to optimize, coming back, to optimize the use of the drain, 
right? So then how it's done, you make an incision right here, okay? This is just uh, for um, demonstration purposes, all right? Um, okay, you get your hemostat, pull it in, all right? And then you secure the, the drain to the wound and then you suture the wound. Right, so if you were expecting this space as dead space, wala kang maapos na muscle, wala kang maapos na fat, it's just empty. Right, you cannot do your suture obliteration technique. Then your go-to would be um, the Penrose drain or any any drain of some sort. Right, and then fluid will just uh, if any fluid will be accumulating here. Right, they, they can escape. They have an escape route para hindi sila mag accumulate inside the wound, right? So this is an example of that, right? You mark it there. You, this is, a I think, the left flank. The left flank of an animal. The left uh, lumbar area, okay? Lateral lumbar area, right? So you make an incision, you pull the, or you could actually do it in the opposite way, right? So now it's there. And for some, right, they anchor the drain on the topmost, all right? Hmm. Guys, this is one thing that I, I think I always receive a question about. The, the, what do you call this? The, the, the fluids, the fluids, okay, can pass through the hole, the inside of the drain, or they can just use this as a board, all right? You can pass through here and then just go through here, all right? Naka-anchor to that. Right, and it's there. So you would expect fluid will come out of there. And that's the dope. Right? You wrap it, you wrap it like that. Right? So active drains. Active drains are basically drains which makes use of a machine. Right? You increase the drain efficiency and efficiency with formation of negative pressure. Right? You want you don't want any space in that area. Kilangan sealed shot. Right? And the fluid suction may be intermittent or continuous. Um, continuous suction on the dead space would decrease chances of drain occlusion because remember, it's not just fluid that goes in there. There's fibrin, there's blood clots. And these big chunks can uh, occlude your drain. Um, this also encourages tissue apposition, which is actually um, a benefit for all drains, right? They could be open or closed. Open. Uh, active drains would have an air vent into the wound uh, to facilitate steady oxygen supply. While closed active drains would be the wound is completely opposed with sutures or it's sealed airtight by a vacuum machine. Let's discuss closed active drains because they're more commonly used, right? This is um, a very cheap way of doing it. Remember your vacutainers, they're called vacutainers, this one. Because there's a vacuum in it, you don't actually have to um, inject the flu, the the blood there. If you connect, if you collect blood from a dog, a five mil syringe, and then you need to transfer that um, uh, that blood into a vacutainer. All you need to do is um, puncture the vacutainer on the rubber top with the needle, and then automatically the vacutainer will vacuum out. Uh, sorry, vacuum in the the blood right because it has built in vacuum in it so you're making use of that okay very cheap um method so what you could do for small wounds like this one they're expecting a dead space here in that in this area they insert a butterfly catheter onto the vacutainer right um don't open anything don't open this end don't open this one just inject all right then as you can see here, the needle is inserted into a vacutainer. Um, you place the, sorry, you place the catheter first here inside, all right? And then you connect it to a vacutainer. You secure that vacutainer around the patient. And you have negative pressure here, which will be sucking in the, uh, the wound fluids inside, all right? And when the vacutainer is full, for example, it's just a five mil vacutainer. Okay, and you see that it also uh, it already contains five ml of uh, wound exudates. Then you have to replace it, right? Because it's not silbe. The vacuum inside 
is only meant to suck in 5 ml maximum. So you need to rem uh, remove the butterfly catheter and replace it with another packetiner. Right? This is it. Yep. You can make fenestrations on the on the end of the butterfly catheter. Basically, you're making a hole on this side. Let's try again. You're making a hole here. Small hole. Okay. On the side lang. Right? Para mas, uh, mas maraming area yung, um, yung wound fluid to enter the tube as compared to just using this one. All right, so mas marami siyang areas. Mas maganda, mas efficient yung, um, yung drain mo. All right? So now you have those holes right there. Right? You put it around. This is the limb. Okay? You put it in right there. Right? So the first 10 to 20 ml drain is usually air because you just did your surgery. Okay? So you have to change the reservoir every time to make sure that there is negative pressure, all right? So this can be attached like this, just use a tape, right? Very easily done. Now, the Jackson Pratt active drain is the go-to drains, except in the Philippines. I don't know why, guys, I don't know. Maybe they're expensive, that's why. The industry, the industry there is just so. We're limited by what our clients can afford. Let, let me be frank. So we as veterinarians are forced to uh, to be resourceful, um, preferring um, cheaper cheaper um, methods of therapy, right? Basically, fact drain is you have a flat drain like this. So imagine your Penrose, pero medyo circular siya, parang straw na paikot, <laughs> right? And then you have a suction ball, okay? Basically, parang plastic ball, okay? Um, Basically, okay. The end of this drain is fenestrated. See how many holes it has. So, ganyang karami yung holes na pwedeng pasukan ng fluid. But also, ganyang karami yung holes na pwedeng ma-occlude ng certain um, fibrin, certain clots. All right? Eh, sorry. And the one good thing about here, about this Jackson Pratt is it has gradations. You can see how many ml the patient has, uh, uh, how many ml the drain has drained from the wound right because you you have to expect you're expecting that wound to drain a little less fluid every day okay dahil gusto mo nagheal nawawala yung dead space kasi nagheal yung wound kapag constant yung amount ng ng fluid na nakukuha mo from the drain for a long period of time there's something wrong because your wound is not healing right you also need to check the quality of that uh, of the fluid that you're draining. Is it bloody? Is it serosanguineous? Is it yellowish? Is it pus-like? Right? Um, honestly, I don't really rely on the gradations. What I do is I drain the bulb. I put it on like in a very in a container and then uh, use a syringe for accurate measurement. Right? So this is done as an example of that. This is an abdomen. Right? They put the, the, the drain there. Now, the where are you gonna put a, a drain in the abdomen? A eh, dead space. Don't. Ano? Hindi naman sila pa dumagdikit dikit don para wala dead space. I get that. Yeah, I, I get that. Um, line of thinking, right? Not gonna persecute you for that. But if you are, if you are conducting an abdominal surgery and you are expecting or you want to monitor the contents of the abdomen, like for example, if you repaired a ruptured urinary bladder. You want to make sure that your repair is not leaking. Okay? Number two, if you are um, repairing or you're removing a foreign body from the intestine or the stomach, right? You have to make sure that your repair, yung pagkakasuture mo nung bituka, pagkakasuture mo nung, nung uh, stomach, will not leak. It will not fail. And this is your go-to measure of detecting any signs of your repair failing, right? Um, because you do not want to see any uh, excessive fluid drained from the abdomen and showing signs of infection, bacteria, signs that it is urine, signs that it has ingesta spillage, right? 
So that's how that's one other indication of these dreams, right? Okay, and how do you create suction? Okay, how you create suction? You see the 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 suction bulb has a cap, and it's a takip. So what you do is you open the takip, <laughs> so funny. Open the cover a bit, all right. Push as much air as possible out of the bulb, and then close it. That will create a negative pressure inside the bulb, and it will suck air instead. It will vacuum the drain, right? So we have this uh, this amount of pressure there. One hand, if you if you um, what do you call this? Um, compress the bulb with one hand. That's just a pressure of eighty five millimeter mercury. If it's two hands, one seventy millimeter mercury. Um, I've gotten used to folding it, na parang lumpia. To remove as much air as possible from the suction tube to create the highest possible pressure inside. Tactics, man. All right, and then you use a Chinese finger trap a suture pattern, right? You remember how the pero yun Troy? <laughs> I don't know any any mythological uh, movie, okay? You, uh, you see those Trojan shoes or Greek sandals? Yung nakikriss-cross siya sa paa ng mga tao at that time. Alright? It's like that. So it's, a ching, um, uh, it's called, um, it's like that. But the original, um, what do you call this, source of Chinese finger trap suture is, it, it looks like a, a toy that they use in China. It's like a finger trap. Okay? Basically, it traps your finger. <laughs> okay? So you secure the tube with that kind of suture. Um, you could also do a purse string and you could use a dressing to cover this wound to prevent infection in this area, right? So um, the other one, that's the, the Jackson prep, right? The other one is you have a machine, okay? You're not, you're not um, kumbaga, compressing the bulb anymore. You have a machine that maintains vacuum in it. So what this does um, I'm going to attach a video for this because it's very much appreciated if you see it happening. Okay? It makes sense to me because I've seen it happening. <laughs> but I'll, I'll just attach a video for it. Um, basically, you have an open wound. Okay? And then you're going to cut. It, it comes with a foam. Actually, a foam ng, ng tama, but much thinner. Right? Then you're going to cut the foam to the shape of the wound margins. And then you're going to place it on top of the wound. Right? You're going to compress that wound with that foam. Right? And then that uh, foam is sealed. Okay? That wound, which is covered by the foam, will then be sealed airtight by adhesive sterile plastic sheets. Imagine um, what they call this cling wrap. Right? But these are medical grade for wound management cling wrap. All right, um, you're gonna seal that wound, right? And there's a tubing connected onto the foam, okay? And then you seal the wound, seal the foam, right? Usually we wrap it around the patient itself. So that creates that environment that's sealed. And then when you turn on the vacuum machine, and it's usually at a 125 millimeter mercury setting, right? That will continuously induce vacuuming of that area where the foam is attached. Right? And the vacuuming of this machine can be set either a continuous vacuum or intermittent. Okay? The intermittent usually is a cycle of five minutes that it's vacuuming and then it rests for two minutes. Right? And this is a common thing that is, um, what do you call this? Uh, common wound management protocol, especially for those clients who can afford it. Right? The foam is changed every 48 hours. They usually also uh, let it just drain for 48 hours um, to, uh, what do you call this? Para itatime nila yung pag-check ng wound, yung recheck ng wound, dun sa pag-change ng foam. So this uh, actually increases blood flow, which is good. It increases the rate of granulation, and it has faster reduction in microbe growth because you are continuously removing the fluids, which can be taken advantage of by the bacteria to live in. Okay, complications number one is pain. Of course, there's this machine connected to you. Wound desiccation because it's continually dry and you don't want it so dry as well. 
um, and wound margin dermatitis because of the you know continual contact with the foam and continue hindi siya makahinga kumbaga, right now when do we know when we can remove drains right when the discharge become serious sanguineous which is um, the medical term for like blood tinge all right and the volume has decreased to at least one fourth of the original discharge right so if you are um, originally originally um, vacuuming or um, getting drainage na mga 20 ml all right 20 ml if you go into a you know decreasing a normal regular decreasing rate and then you go to less than 5 then that's a good uh, time to remove the drain right but again if uh, the doctor would usually just have uh, just know i guess these are i don't know they 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 just know <laughs> sometimes i think it's uh it's um a way of their surgical decision making you know they figure that it's time then it's time <laughs> right and uh, usually two to five days after placement of a vacuum is enough right so wound stabilization and protection um again bandages of wound dressings are very important part of that uh, we're going to discuss bandages and wound dressings on uh, by next week sorry this week this friday um and how to place them but i'm not going to focus much on how to place because that will be covered in surgery uh, one laboratory we're in you're going to do it while the professor demonstrates it okay now closure once you're ready to close all right once you're ready to close there must not be any presence or any sign of contamination necrotic tissue excessive tension or dead space right this results to uh wound dehiscence and further loss of tissue again if any part of the fundamental steps you skip or you did not do right, this will just affect the last step, which is wound closure. All right, so you have to do everything right. You have to consider a lot of the factors that could affect your patient or is currently affecting your patient. So a lot of your decision making and surgical judgment will be in play, right? Uh, so what are the factors affecting wound closure? Um, amount of time elapsed after injury. Um, before any treatment has been instituted. The degree of contamination, if you increase the degree of contamination, you also increase the risk of uh, wound dehiscence and infection and delayed closure. The amount of tissue damage, of course, if there is much tissue to be formed um, because a lot of was damaged, of course, it would take a longer time. Debridement efficacy, how good was your debridement method to remove those devitalized tissues? Uh, the status of wounds blood supply this is why it's very important for you to also debride because when you um there's one advantage that they said about mechanical debridement you you always um are sure that the wound is bleeding <laughs> which is good um animal's health of course would be in the very important play here the extent of tension in that space to begin with and the wound location right is there so much tension in that area so for example, if I make an incision on the limb as compared to making an incision on the dorsal neck wherein there's much excessive skin, there's not much tension. Right? So you will, that will also have an influence as to how, when you could close, how well your closure is going to be. All right. So that is it for the management of open wounds. You've been with me for like, what, one and a half hour. Thank you so much. Um, we, I will try. I will try my best, I promise, <laughs> to have a Zoom meeting um, on Friday. All right. Um, uh, let me know if you have any questions. I will not have, I think, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I was going to say I will not have an, a quiz for this, but um, I'm not sure. We'll see. All right. But I will be posting them together for the for, for module seven. And this is module eight. Um, I could, yeah. I'm, I'm probably gonna need to make a quiz for this but the, again it's gonna be available for like a week to extend you know uh to give you more allowance for it all right thank you very much uh you guys let me know if you have any questions and i'll see you next time bye